Science facts for fans. This one goes. I'm gonna clone some DNA. Let's do it. These are cells expressing fluorescent pro. What's going on? It's Malik and Miles. And today we're gonna to be talking about what it's like being PhD students in bioengineering. So, bioengineering. Wait, guys, we have to save this for the MIT abstract. Let's go. Hello, everyone. I'm Miles. I'm Malik. And we're Malik and Miles. And we're so happy to be here today. We have uh, a, a great presentation, a quick snapshot into our uh, into our daily lives, our research lives, what we do when we're not at research. Um, and we're really happy to be here. So without stalling, let's get into it. All right, so just a little bit about ourselves. So we are of course, twins, I know you were asking, but we are from central New Jersey originally. We went to public schools uh, from K through 12, culminating in us graduating high school as co-valutorians. Uh, you can see our pictures at the top right after delivering a very fun uh, speech uh, at the podium together. Also, I just wanna highlight when we were in high school, we also did a club slash class called Science Research, where we were able to do experiments uh, as high school students. After finishing high school and going to college, we decided to go to MIT, where we graduated in 2022. Uh, we, we majored in biological engineering, and we'll go into what that is very shortly, as well as minoring in African and African diaspora studies, focusing on Black and, Afri uh, Black and African Americans in the United States. And lastly, uh, once we finished all of our uh, schooling and eventually graduated, it was a long, long four years, uh, we decided to actually stay at MIT where we are now uh, graduate students, PhD students, still in biological engineering and still at MIT. Uh, you can see some images on the bottom of our lab coats as we upgraded from the black gowns to white jackets, which you also can see we are wearing right now. To go a little bit more about what we did in undergrad, Miles. Uh, when we're not doing our academics or research, we really have a large passion for science communication and science outreach. We want to bring the science that makes us so interested uh, to go to work every day. Uh, we want to share that back with you. And so we got into science communication through mainly social media. What this meant was about two, three years ago, we started making videos on the internet, starting on TikTok, of us making memes, skits, jokes, little science explanations. We did a little dances here and there, just trying to see if we could be relatable to anyone, really just put off our daily uh, stress into media. And people seem to really like it. And we've been able to uh, grow uh, to the size you see here, uh, roughly on TikTok, and we've branched uh, out to Instagram and YouTube as well. Uh, more recently, we've been able to partner with a lot of cool groups, a lot of fun groups, some uh, national, some global, some here local to MIT in the Boston area. Most notably, we had a huge uh, commercial with Microsoft um, over a year ago. If we ever interrupted uh, your basketball championship, we are not sorry. And more recently, we were a part of Shark Week. Uh, we did not make it on TV, but we did make a trivia uh, video for their social media. So that was pretty cool. And so we continue this social media work now when we're not doing research. Finding that balance is always fun and always a challenge, but we really like doing it and we are happy to still be continuing it. Now, speaking a little bit about the, re the research that we did in undergrad, uh, we jumped between a lot of different labs, but overall, we worked in this bioengineering or biological engineering space. And what that means is we take all of the cool, fun parts of biology, so plants, animals, but speci specifically the really small components that make them up. So cells, DNA, other molecules, other tissues, things like that. And we then apply engineering to that. So that's modeling, design, building all of these kind of creative and construction elements in order to create solutions to problems using biology. And so the first example of this is that we did a competition called iGen, which is this international genetic engineering synthetic biology competition. And all that basically means 
is you can see this uh, little image right here. We essentially take cells and then we use DNA to essentially write instructions to make them act like, honestly, little machines. We can make them do entirely new behaviors and very cool stuff. Uh, specifically, we looked at your white blood cells, so your immune cells, and we were trying to get them to follow uh, bacteria and other germs in the body more effectively. So we had tons of days on the microscope, watching these immune cells move back and forth on the slide, trying to chase things. It was a really fun opportunity. You want to talk about some of our later years in undergrad? Well, after iGEM, I moved into a uh, neuroscience lab. And so I stayed in the microscope room, but I got to look at fluorescence. So images like here in the bottom left of making different parts of a cell glow, I got to make neurons glow, which is this image right here. So I got to see a lot of lines and triangles and a lot of really cool images. Fun fact, uh, neurons, like other cells, they grow in a 3D space. So not only can you see them grow outward like this, you can see them uh, grow upward as well as they move towards other things in their environment. And so I spent time trying to look at how you can look at the different elements inside of a neuron and how different chemicals and uh, ions move between them. So I could really see how uh, one ion in the middle of the cell would move towards one of the arms. Uh, and I would see that over many hours uh, and I got really exposed to how cool fluorescence could be, how connected your neurons are, and things like that. While he was doing that, I returned back to the immune system uh, space, but instead it was purely from a computer. So I did some biological modeling uh, and basically wrote various codes and drew various schematics trying to exactly map out if you get uh, sick with a disease, say like a virus, for example, how does that virus enter the body? What cells attack it first? How does the virus make more of itself? And all these complex uh, interactions in order to kind of see how we can better engineer uh, the immune system or things to help it in order to fight these viral diseases. And finally, a very interesting opportunity we had is that we both were able to partner with the Synthetic Biology Center in South Africa in order to help uh, model how COVID-19 was progressing uh, in the region uh, a couple years back, as well as kind of an overall assessment of their lab and biology capabilities and thinking about how we can uh, develop biotechnology in South Africa and other regions in that part of the world. Now, as for what we're currently doing in our PhD research, we have a lot of themes, and hopefully today we'll be able to explain how we can fit climate change research, agricultural research, microbial engineering, which we will get into, as well as just general biotechnology in Africa. And somehow all of this landed us uh, in Kenya uh, this uh, recent last summer, as you can see us uh, standing in front of uh, a cornfield. Now, in order to understand why we're in front of a cornfield in Kenya, we're going to have to talk about corn a little bit. So not to scare anyone, but here is a projection that researchers have made about uh, corn production, uh, maize, uh, corn yields over the next century in different areas of the world that are known to produce a lot of corn. And what you can see is there's a lot of red and orange. And what this means is there's uh, predicted to be a relatively large decline in the amount of yields of corn or how much corn farms will be able to get uh, in the next in the next 100 years. And so this is kind of scary because corn and like many other foods is very staple uh, to our diets as they are right now. And we have to think about better ways to actually increase our yields as our population increases. And a lot of these yield changes come uh, from the negative effects of climate change on our environment. And so, what we're saying here is that climate change has been reducing farm yields with changing temperatures, uh, differing climates, more uh, irregular weather patterns, storms, things like that. But what's interesting about the agriculture is that agriculture is actually one of the largest sectors that contributes to climate change through the release of greenhouse gases. And greenhouse gases are the gases that uh, trap heat in our atmosphere, which cause all these effects to our weather. And one of the biggest ways those contributes is through fertilizer and fertilizer usage. 
So with fertilizers, one of the most important nutrients for plants is ammonia, which is this NH3. And to get enough of it to support our very large agricultural communities, uh, we produce this synthetically. So uh, in a factory, we essentially combine nitrogen gas and hydrogen in a very specific manner, and it produces ammonia. This process is very intensive. It is by itself 1% of the world's energy just for this, and it produces a lot of carbon dioxide, which is the main greenhouse gas that we, we think about. And it's currently not sustainable for our environment to keep producing uh, fertilizer this way, especially since um, the way we apply these fertilizers uh, releases a lot of a different greenhouse gas, nitrous oxide. And nitrous oxide is per molecule, uh, per piece of it is 300 times more worse for our atmosphere than CO2 because it has a much uh, higher potential of trapping heat. And so the way we develop synthetic fertilizers now is not sustainable and we need to think about new ways to do it to be cleaner and greener for our planet. Now, lucky for us, this is not the only way to make ammonia. In fact, uh, nature has been doing it for hundreds and probably thousands of years. So let's look at legumes. If you don't know what legumes are, these are your favorite vegetable. At least they should be because they're high in protein. And why are they high in protein? It's because they are able to fix nitrogen. So these are your beans, your peas, your nuts. And in addition to being very delicious, they have very special roots that essentially are paired with these bacteria and these evolutionary links go back a very long time and very specific. But what it allows them to do is that these bacteria can take nitrogen straight out of the air, 70% or so of the atmosphere is nitrogen, and these bacteria can take it out of the air and turn it into ammonia and other nitrogen compounds to give directly to the, to the plant. Now, the problem is that these bacteria only occur, occur on legume roots. They do not occur on your cereals. These are your wheat, your corn, your rice in Africa, uh, millet and sorghum as well. But the issue is that those are the crops that are the world's calories. So most foods and the calorically dense foods are made of these cereal crops. Now, if only we could get these bacteria to work for cereals. What well, is where bioengineering can come in? And this is uh, specifically the field that we work in, which is called synthetic biology. And all of this is about, this is more kind of like that iGym example I said earlier, which is that we can redesign cells to perform new functions using DNA and other molecular parts. And so in this case, what if we took soil bacteria that already existed and we looked for bacteria that could fix nitrogen and it could associate or colonize with the roots of corn and then, you know, engineer it some more, make it op optimize and make it a little better. Well, we would have some bacteria that you could use as a living biofertilizer. And this isn't just hypothetical. This is actually a real product. Product. It's been worked on uh, by several groups, including uh, our own labs uh, for many years. And there, are all, and there are companies that actually do this and it can be sold and supplied to farms. Uh, there's one example that's currently on over 10 million uh, acres or so in the US alone. And it actually uh, fixes nitrogen and improves uh, or, and improves corn growth uh, the same way as synthetic fertilizers. Now this goes into what my brother and I uh, research specifically uh, trying to advance and further this idea. And so specifically what we work on is we are trying to figure out the ways of bettering the survival of these microbes once they're engineered. So when you engineer these microbes, you do it at a lab bench under very pristine, very controlled conditions, but then you have to uh, have these engineered microbes be stored until they're uh, ready to be used. And that has differences in temperature, humidity, uh, other storage conditions that have to be optimized so that once they are deployed to the field, they can be ready to function. And then when you think about deploying them to the field, so let's say laying it on your crops or the soil of your crops, they have to be able to establish a stable colony in that soil and still produce the same function that you engineered however long ago uh, you they were engineered in a lab. 
And so we are trying to look at the ways to better optimize the bacteria to do this growth and survivability. Um, but on top of that, to find the parameters and the conditions that we have to optimize for, uh, another thing that uh, we have to do is go to the regions and think about the regions that we're engineering the microbes for. And so to do that, if one of the areas we're interested in is Africa, specifically Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in communities that already um, are less nutrient rich and their access to some of these uh, fertilizers is lower and to improve their agriculture. Uh, we looked at Kenya for one example of this, who is a high producer of corn and maize. We need to see what their environment is like, what their conditions are like, their climate, to better understand how to better engineer for them. And that's why this past summer we were in Kenya. We actually got to see um, local agricultural communities and see these live uh, corn farms here from farmers, uh, what their thoughts were on agriculture moving forward and their thoughts of engineered microbes like this being used. And we even got to see um, some tests on what these engineered microbes would look like in that environment. And so we think very deeply about how our technologies would be applied to the world because that's what we're engineering them for. And so with all of that, we'd like to thank you for listening to us. We hope you learned a little bit about bioengineering, climate science, how to grow corn. Um, you know, we're very passionate about our work and it's been a very fun opportunity and insightful opportunity to be able to combine our research and this kind of science communication element um and so and ultimately you know if you want to uh, see kind of a bit more of what we do i recommend checking out our website but overall we combine science and this communication and you know what if it means we have to do a couple of tiktok dances along the way might as well thank you thank you thank you both so much let's jump into this q a we already have a lot of questions from northern Anglia students and a lot of really good questions to kick us off, I wonder if you could cover from a North Anglia student um, a question that asks, what inspired you into, you know, biological engineering in the first place? Can you tell us how you came upon that uh, initially and, and what grasped your attention so that you've stayed in it for your PhD? Absolutely. Um, we have a very fun story that uh, comes to us from middle school. One day in uh, our intro science class, we were both uh, independently flipping through the biology textbook, and we both stumbled on the same image at the end, and it showed bacteria being engineered to produce human ins insulin. And it was just a drawing. It was, uh, it was a very uh, interesting fact, but not really too much on how that process worked. We just knew that scientists were using bacteria to make a protein for humans for medicine. And we thought this was super cool, super interesting. And we both thought whatever this field is, we want to do that. And so that's how we got introduced to bio biological engineering. And we've been researching stuff ever since then to try to figure out uh, how to do that in the future. And that's pretty much landed us to where we are now. That's totally amazing. And that leads me into our next question from a North Anglia student named Tiara. And Tiara is wondering if you could invent or work on any futuristic biotechnology, what do you think it would be? And how do you envision it making a positive impact on society? Uh, I believe that we both can answer. I have, I've had an idea for, honestly, I guess this is my like high school idea. Don't um, spoil it. <laughs> the, um, I'm not sure how feasible it is, I'm sure it's been thought about. So that's why I'll say it here publicly, but I always had an idea about uh, if you could uh, uh, accelerate the growth of trees. Um, but a lot of people do research on age and things like that. So I'm sure someone's thought of it or it might be even working on it as we speak, but uh, there could be one way you could uh, increase the age of trees. So let's say you can reach the mat a mature forest in even half the time. Uh, it wouldn't be enough to like supplement how much wood we take, but it would be a big effort in trying to restore some of these forests that have been lost from just uh, centuries of uh, industrialization across the planet. For me, um, 
I guess my idea isn't one that's too far out in the future. I'm sure there are many groups that are working on it, but I would like to see some of them, uh, I guess, be approved in our lifetime. Uh, there are the ideas of these essentially engineered cellular therapies, where essentially you can engineer uh, cells that can sense things and then perform some action. And theoretically, you could have these uh, floating around, uh, like circulating in your bloodstream and actively monitoring things. And one example I think about is, uh, you know, kind of with the insulin example, if you had uh, a cell that could essentially sense your blood's glucose levels and automatically essentially secrete insulin um, in uh, in response to that is an example of kind of one of these cellular therapies that many groups are working on this and probably similar ideas, but seeing some of those get actuated would be really exciting. I'd really like to see both of those ideas out in the world. I suspect they could help so many people. That is totally awesome and, and really creative. Um, following that up, um, you kind of described the process of, you know, engineering these cells to work in, in particular situations. And a Nord Anglia student is wondering, how do you engineer a cell? What does that look like? What does that entail? Great question. Uh, first answer, very difficult. But uh, yeah, it's not everything's uh, hard in some capacity. Uh, in general, so you have D, uh, the simplest way I can uh, explain it is you have DNA and DNA is all of these, it's a molecule, it has all these nucleotides, but essentially it's comprised of genes and then things that turn genes on and off. It's a general simplification, but it works for this example. And so the idea is that if you can essentially, we can now uh, synthesize DNA, whether it's uh, things from existing species or sometimes even completely new ideas, the idea is that if you can get one of these strands of DNA, put the right genes and other machinery uh, encoded onto it, and then you transform uh, a cell with that DNA, that cell will then start uh, producing whatever that DNA molecule says to do. And, and that transformation is essentially uh, you take your DNA in a vial and you add it to a vial of cells. And then in a process that I can only describe as nuance magic, you put them together and you either uh, put it on ice, put it in hot water and then put it in ice again, or you run an electrical current through it. And through that process, uh, the cells take up the new DNA and then begin expressing it. This is a simplification that I have to teach myself on why this works every three months, but that is essentially the process. You put them together in a vial and- uh, You shake it up. And you shake it up essentially. Uh, and under the right conditions, the bacteria will take that and you can see growth and potentially new production of whatever you wanted them to do for bacteria uh, in less than 24 hours. So very cool uh, for things like uh, mammalian cells, so cells you might derive from mice or even uh, cell lines that have come from humans. You can see expression of these things probably within a day, day and a half. So it's really cool. Um, Scientists out every day are trying to figure out better ways uh, to clone, make it more efficient, and uh, put more and more complex things to see how we can really develop these really complex systems. But that's the general basis: DNA cells, tube, magic. magic. And I think you might have mentioned this a little bit in your answer, but did you say that magic takes three months to work? Oh no! So essentially. Uh, unless you're doing uh, plants, unless, uh, unless some species so, take a very long time. Uh, if you some people who work on plant engineering, you have to wait for the entire very much the plant to grow, so that can take months. If you're trying to do uh, some complex uh, systems to make some stable production, uh, those can take months, but pretty much it's a almost an overnight, if not like within one week process. I was saying that uh, every three months I have to relearn how that happens because mm. it confuses me yes. uh, to this day well, on why this works. So for like the common bacteria work with in lab, essentially, uh, if you know mitosis or when the bacteria grows and divides into two cells, basically that is on average every say 30 minutes. And so for a bacteria like that, yeah, if you uh, do the shaking DNA magic at about 5 p.m., you let it... Uh, shake and grow in an incubator, which is basically just a shaking oven with some uh, rich food media for it to be in uh, by the next morning, say if I had it expressing 
green fluorescent protein, which is a protein that glows green when exposed to the right uh, what color of light. Uh, in the morning, I should see a plate that is hopefully all green. More than likely, it will be some fraction green because that magic that we talk about is it 100% efficient, but you can see some expression usually. Got it. Thank you for walking us through that. And I wonder something that I think about a lot um, in, in abstracts is, you know, a lot of us at, at MIT are, are trying very difficult things in our work. And I suspect that it, this magic doesn't always happen. Um, can you tell us how you, you know, deal with the idea of, of failure or maybe um, setting up an experiment that doesn't complete? I can talk about this. So um, I've joined a lab this earlier this year in February. So this is my st still my first full year in uh, upon joining a lab in my PhD. Um, I have been really interested in this one circuit. And so this is a really part of inter interesting part of biological engineering, which is essentially thinking about how you can create circuits like electrical circuits, except all of your parts are genes and proteins. And so I've been trying to uh, de uh, develop this circuit for in soil bacteria uh, since maybe May or so. And I still have yet got it to work. And I've done many, many iterations of just the circuit design to even get to a point of testing. Within the last week, I've made uh, very large progress. And as we speak, I'm trying to run the first uh protocol to get my DNA into my cells, because unlike the normal process of the cells we were describing that's overnight, uh, for this circuit, I have to put DNA into uh, one bacteria and then foster the circuit in that bacteria. And then when that's ready, I have to put it in the soil bacteria uh, because bacteria can do this cool thing where they, if this is one bacteria and this is another bacteria, they basically can share DNA by this uh, bacteria randomly getting rid of DNA and this bacteria randomly taking it up. And this is how different bacteria uh, get the same mutations. Um, they can like basically share different genetic parts that they have between each other. And so through that process, I can I build the circuit in this bacteria and then transfer it to this one. And so for the entire year, I've been trying to build the circuit in this bacteria. And I've just now gone to a part where I think I'm ready to transfer it. Um, but that process has taken many weeks of iterating, a lot of weeks of cloning, not like making a twin cloning or not Dolly the sheep cloning. Uh, cloning is the, what we, uh, is the term for, uh, I guess, cloning DNA and building DNA parts and trying to uh, assemble them, honestly, like Lego pieces, because you gotta make sure things overlap and things um, align properly. And so that process of cloning can take, if you're lucky and you're amazing, which I am not, it could take a week. I've been working on it for months. Uh, and so that process is a lot of back and forth. And so you really gotta just never give up, keep moving forward, uh, try new things. I'm talking to a lot of people in the lab who've done this before and leaning on that is really important. And just having this, uh, having a great idea is always good and is the uh, foundation of a good project. But putting in the work to keep trying new things on that idea is really what's going to get you to the finish line in the end. And so having the work ethic to move forward and persevere, even when there's many, many, many challenges ahead. That is totally fair. And so, it, yeah, it sounds like hard work, persistence, not giving up in the face of a challenge is, is really key to this. And by the way, we we think you are amazing. Miles, just so you know, uh, kudos on the progress this week. <laughs> my, my cells would say otherwise. I <laughs> I think he's doing great. I see him at bench, pipetic. By the way, if you ever were curious, I'll it make up my own question real quick. If you're ever curious what the average uh, day in the life of bioengineer is, at least a wet lab one, you have a really funny tool. It's like our screwdriver. It's a pipette. And so you might have used like the little like droppers that like are plastic and you squeeze in and water comes up. Imagine that, but it costs a couple of hundred thousand, hundred or thousand dollars. I hope they don't cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, but maybe the really high end ones do. But the idea is that you have a really fancy one where you press down on a plunger, you suck up liquid, and then you move that over to some other tube 
You press that down, you inject the liquid. You do that some amount of times, and then you put it into some magical machine, which is probably something you have in your kitchen, but just more expensive. There's like, you know, you have your ovens, which are called incubators. You have your pressure cooker, which is called an autoclave. You have your shakers, which is basically just a non-slicing a thing. whisk, a uh, whisk. You know, but basically it's every form of thing you have in your kitchen make it cost a thousand dollars plug it in and that's what we do we transfer liquids to things and we put them in machines and we hope cells grow we hope that cells grow and we hope that dna either goes in or comes out for me i do a lot of experiments where i tried to get dna out of cells uh which is basically what he does but in reverse not actually, but uh, it has the same levels of failure, which is why I say it's the opposite. But, you know, you keep trying, you keep trying new ideas, and you move along, and eventually it does work, and you get and you feel very satisfied. And then you forget that you have to do it, do it again for something else, but we don't talk about it. Thank you for walking us through that and, and for telling us about those kitchen analogies. But of course, this is not something folks should be trying at home, which is totally no. fair. But it is it is interesting to know how there is so much, so many connections between science and what we're doing in our kitchen as well. Um, this takes me to an, another question um, related to this research, actually, from Dripto. And, and Dripto is wondering, why do we need ammonia for plants in the first place? And are there any other gases we could use to help plants grow? Thank you, Drifto. This is a great question. So you have to, we have to dive a little bit into some biochemistry to understand this. I'll keep it really short. Uh, you know what? I learned an acronym when I was in middle school, and now all of you will too. Uh, N-CHOPS. N-C-H-O-P-S. These are the letters of six, yes, six elements that are the most abundant in the body. Nitrogen, Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Those are, it's like 96, maybe more percent of you is made up of those elements. Uh, basically, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, you eat those or breathe them in. But, sh you know, sugar has like three of those. Um, and that you basically just get by breathing and eating. The remaining three, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Sulfur you also get from eating uh, most of the time some phosphorus, some nitrogen. Thing is, here's the secret. Plants don't eat food, at least the same the ways we do. We get them by eating the plant or eating something that ate the plant. The way the plant gets it is from rocks. Uh, and the idea is that some, uh, especially in the case of nitrogen and phosphorus, there are only specific forms that the roots can actually take up. Uh, and we call them like soluble or uh, what we call them fixed nitrogen sources. So a plant cannot breathe in nitrogen gas and use that to build things. Instead, it has to use ammonia, urea, other compounds that contain nitrogen. And yeah, only certain bacteria essentially can turn the nitrogen from the air into those forms. Or again, you can make it chemically, but that has a lot of environmental impact. But yeah, the idea is that the original source of these uh, elements that the plants have to get from somewhere, but they have to be in very specific forms. People are also researching maybe how you can engineer plants to take up other forms of these molecules, of these uh, chem of these elements, but that is also an entirely different engineering challenge in itself. Got it. Thank you for walking us through that. And that leads me to another question from a North Anglia student who's wondering, how do you get into biotechnology or synthetic biology in the first place, they're specifically wondering, do you need to be good at math? And they're really interested in, in pursuing this in the future. So they're wondering, what should they be working on and thinking about? Okay, so to answer the math question, um, math fosters, um, math, I would say fosters logic and following steps and uh, math, um, and science go hand in hand, but that is, you do not need to be like uh, a super expert in math um, to be able to uh, do biology or do biological engineering. Uh, as you um, develop what you're interested in, um, people develop different tools and different methods and 
modeling, uh, which I would say is probably the big M, M for modeling, M for math. But um, my advice is is to just explore what you're interested in, what you're interested in. Um, just if you just Google science news or biology news, if that's what you want to get into, you'll see dozens, if not hundreds of products and ideas and discoveries that people make every single day. And uh, I challenge all of you to, when you find something you're interested in, take one extra step and try to research uh, like either like who does that research or what place does that research or what field that research is in. So for example, if you're interested in medicine, there's a whole field of discovering new medicines or testing new medicines. Um, if you're interested in uh, the immune system or some specific um, disease or some different or some specific cell. If you research if you research that, you can find out really cool things on how people are trying to study it or trying to cure it, things like that. Um, uh, biotechnology is very blossoming. Uh, it's a very large and emerging field as our understanding of the nature and biology around us has increased uh, very rapidly in the last couple of decades. There's many ideas that come out. Many companies come out. Uh, many new research areas. And so it's a forever changing field. By the time y'all are in college and stuff, we're telling you now will sound simple. Um, it just, the field really grows that fast. So whatever you're interested in, uh, just look into it and see um, how, and see specifically like what there is to know. And then uh, if you fall, if you follow the interest, it'll lead you to what classes you might want to take or what math you need to know and things like that. So it just starts with an idea and an interest and the rest follows. Do good in math. I'm just gonna, <laughs> but it, it, you, it, it will fall. You, math was a basis for pretty much anything. There will be numbers and calculations, especially if you go into engineering field. So in general, uh, brush up on it, but yes, the uh, specialties in your math and other fields uh, will should relate to your interest. Got it. Okay, that is that is really good to know. And now we have a question um, from a North Anglia student who's wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your experiences being siblings and colleagues. I think Malik, you mentioned seeing Miles in the at the lab bench. What's it like to do you know PhDs together? And um, you know, do you guys ever bounce ideas off each other? He's a pain in my side. No, <laughs> no. Uh, so uh, our benches are next to each other, which is very fun. Uh, the best thing is we share a box of gloves. Fun thing about being identical twins is your hand sizes are pretty, pretty much just about. Um, so we share a box of gloves. We do not share pipettes. That's like, you know, That's personal. Sacred. I, 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 I have my name laminated on mine. I don't you know. know what he does with his pipettes on that side of the bench. Mm -hmm. We share the box of pipettes. Hi, pet tips. Of you course, know. you know the two. You don't need two separate tips, but I have my own. You know, just as you have your own spatula. So, you know, I have a whole line. They're all hanging. What do I have a spatula for? Anyway, so, so it's a kitchen analogy. So, anyway, so the point is, is that uh, being next to each other, our research, uh, as you can tell by the presentation, we are in very related research fields, and so our our research kind of overlaps. So while he focuses on uh, engineering for storage, I try to focus on the engineering after storage into the field. And so together you get more or less a complete product of the optimal bacteria. Don't any, okay, if there's any bioengineers watching this right now, I know I said the optimal bacteria, don't scrutinize me because it's I, it's not a one bacteria fits all, okay? But we're trying to explain here. So don't, don't, don't come for me, please. Uh, it's for the analogy, you know, uh, one, one up, any end of the kitchen on one cake fits all see that sounds more mm -hmm. because there's chocolate vanilla we like red velvet anyway the point is um trying to engineer for this problem uh you had to come from from you had to come at from different angles and so we work on those different angles of the same problem and then we come together like on our trips to kenya uh to do to do this field work and so um moving that along with both our passion for science communication and us being able to work together to make videos to make things more exciting and stuff uh is always fun and it's always great to have someone to bounce ideas off of 
That's totally fantastic. So we have a lot of amazing questions in the Q&A pod that we won't be able to get to all of them, but I want to leave you with one last one, and it's kind of thinking ahead. Um, we have a question um, from Mr. Brett's classroom, and they're wondering, apart from porn, do you see you applying these biological engineering principles to other projects in the future? Yes, thank you. Uh, it's a great question. Um, so thinking along this uh, same idea, uh, there is a uh, talk about how we can apply these uh, bacteria to other cereal crops. Uh, there is some talks about, you know, uh, wheat. Um, rice is a little tricky because rice is grown like in a flooded marsh, so it has its own kind of uh, microbe situation. But as well as some of the other stables, I say, like are popular in uh, other parts of the world, particularly Africa, like millet and sorghum. So uh, in essence, um, not the specific microbes we work on because those have been selected for their abilities to work with corn, but theoretically, you could apply these same principles to bacteria that associate with the roots of these other crops. And in general, uh, this whole kind of field uh, of engineering these soil uh, microbes, there's just so much uh, potential that goes into it you know, carbon sequestration, so bacteria that can take CO2 out of the air to help with, um, to help essentially with greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, if you could somehow apply this technology to other components, like I said, like phosphorus um, and, other and other elements that are needed uh, for plants. But overall, yeah, this, this field is just a really interesting thinking about how we can uh, take what already exists in nature uh, give it a little bit of fine tuning and then repurpose it to uh, to help uh, nature, honestly, to help nature again. So, got it. Thank you so much. It sounds like there's a lot of amazing future applications for this work. Um, and then last last quick question, actually, I want to sneak it in there for the students who want to learn more about the work you're doing. Where where can they find y'all? We are at Malik and Miles on everything. If you add a dot com to the end, that's our website. Put an at in the front with no spaces. That's pretty much all of our social medias. Um, if you put a contact at in the front of a dot com, that's our email, which is also on the website, which is malikandmiles.com. Pretty much, uh, if you can't remember our names, if you, I'm happy to say if you look up MIT twins, we actually show up on the first page of Google. Um, and so any way like that, uh, you can reach out and see what we're up to. Um, we're trying to find some new exciting content to go into the year, a little bit more of vlogging, sort of more of my pains at the bench. Um, your pipetting, your pipetting. Oh, yes, yes, my 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 pipetting and my amazing cloning skills mm -hmm. um, and just things like that. So check us out anywhere there. Uh, we'd be happy to reply to you and show you a bit more of what we do. Got it. Thank you both so much. And with that, I'd like to thank the MIT Nordanglia Education Collaboration for making this series possible. I'd like to thank all the students and teachers who tuned on and shared their amazing questions and curiosities with us today. And lastly, I'd like to thank Malik and Miles um, for sharing part of their morning with us. Thank you both so much. This was really excited and I think we all learned so, so much. Awesome, okay. Well, goodbye, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.